five. Good afternoon and welcome to this Regulatory Transparency Project webinar. My name is Sarah Bankson and I'm Associate Director of RTP at the Federalist Society. Today, September 25th, 2023, we are pleased to host a discussion on the EPA's proposed power plant rule. Please note that as always, all expressions of opinion on today's program are those of the speakers. After the discussion, our panel will take audience questions, so please submit those questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Our moderator for today's discussion is Darren Bax. Darren is director of the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, where he's also a senior fellow. If you're interested in learning more about our speakers, please, you can read their full and impressive bios at regproject.org. Thank you all for joining. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Darren. Thank you, Sarah. And good afternoon. My name is Darren Bax, as Sarah said, and I am director of the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I want to thank you for joining us today as we discuss the EPA's new proposed uh, power plant rule uh, to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from these new and existing power plants. This is the EPA's third attempt to regulate these emissions. Attempt one was the Obama administration's Clean Power Plan, which the Supreme Court struck down in West Virginia versus EPA. That case is especially important because it was the first case which the court formally acknowledged the major questions doctrine. In simple terms, there are some extraordinary cases that require there to be a clear statement of authority from Congress for the agency's asserted power, given the scope and significance of the power asserted by the agency. As the court explained, thus in certain extraordinary cases, both separation of powers principles and a practical understanding of legislative intent make us reluctant to read into ambiguous statutory text the delegation claimed be lurking there. So that was attempt one. So attempt two was the Trump administration's Affordable Clean Energy Rule, or ACE Rule. In 2019, the EPA replaced the Clean Power Plan with the ACE Rule. The DC Circuit struck down the ACE Rule, and it's in a sort of limbo. EPA has delayed its implementation, and, and no one seriously expects it'll ever come into effect. So now we're dealing with attempt three, the Biden administration's proposed rule that has no catchy name. The rule was published in the Federal Register on May 23rd, and the comment period ended on August 8th. Now it was recently on regulations.gov, and this proposed rule has received over 1.2 million comments. So maybe there's a lot of form comments out there, but regardless, there's a lot of interest in this rule, as there, sh as there should be. So let's get right to it. And I'm honored to be joined by three leading experts, and their bios can be found on the event web page, as Sarah said. Jeffrey Holmstead is a partner at Bracewell LLP and formerly headed the EPA's Office of Air and, Radi uh, Office of Air and Radiation. Kevin Pollenkars is a partner at Covington and Burlington LLP, and he co-chairs the firm's environment, Environmental and Energy Practice Group, Energy Industry Group, and ESG Practice. And Justin Schwab is founder of CGCN Law, PLLC, and he served as Deputy General Counsel at the EPA. To start our program, Jeff will provide an overview of the proposed rule, including some of the background leading up to the rule. Kevin and Justin will then each provide their brief perspective on the legal and policy implications of the rule. We'll then have a discussion to help flesh out these issues. And that will include taking your questions. So please do submit your questions and I can try to incorporate them into the discussion. So, Jeff, let me turn the program over to you to provide an overview of the, of the rule. Great, thank you. Um, I, 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 I suspect that, um, that most of the, of, the, of the listeners, most of the participants are, are at least somewhat familiar with the rule. But let me just do a quick, a quick bit of background and explanation to set up, uh, to set up the discussion. Um, since 1970, uh, Section 111 has been a, a major part of the Clean Air Act. At least Section 111A has been an important part of the Clean Air Act because it was under that section that EPA sets what are called new source performance standards. And EPA identifies a type of industrial source uh, known as a source category 
then it sets standards of performance uh, that any new source in that category has to meet. That program is typically called the NSPS program. Um, under certain conditions, EPA can also require states to set uh, standards of performance for existing sources in that same source category. In, in both cases, these standards of performance are, supp are supposed to be uh, based on, in fact, I think this language is important because I suspect we'll be coming back to it uh, again and again, but whether you're talking new plants or existing plants, the standard of performance means um, a standard for emission reductions of, uh, for emissions of air pollutants, which reflects the degree of emission limitation achievable through the application of the best system of emission reduction, which taking into account the cost of achieving such reduction and any non-air quality health and environmental impacts and energy requirements, the administrator determines has been adequately demonstrated. Um, so th this recent proposal is designed to establish section 111A limits for new fossil fuel power, power plants and, and to require states to set standard of performance for existing uh, fossil fuel power plants with, within their states. Um, and it, it, I, I won't go too much into the history of the clean power plan because it's been much talked about. I suspect most people uh, are, are, are familiar with it. But ultimately what, the, what, what EPA did that the Supreme Court struck down is the agency said, look, the most cost-effective way to reduce emissions from the power sector is to shift generation away from coal and natural gas plants to other types of cleaner generation, uh, mostly in EPA's view, wind and solar, but, but also uh, nuclear power plants were among those that, that, were, that were recognized. And the idea behind the Clean Power Plan was explicitly to shift generation away from the higher polluting plants to much lower CO2 sources of emissions. Um, the, the Supreme Court said basically that that sort of generation shifting was beyond EPA's authority because Congress had not clearly uh, uh, given that type of authority to EPA. The, the new proposed regulation was clearly drafted with, with that in mind um, and the agency explicitly uh, sort of followed what it, what it says is its traditional approach for setting these standards by identifying, by identifying um, uh, systems of emission reduction that can be applied to an individual source and can be used to reduce emissions from, from that source. And I will talk probably more about what those are, but EPA very clearly designed this to, to avoid the problems with, uh, that, that came up with the, with the clean power plan. Um, I think in doing that, in addition to sort of avoiding the explicit generation shifting, the, their, their intention was to try to, to put this in, to create issues where the courts typically defer to EPA. Um, the EPA has a long history of identifying best systems of, of emission reductions that can be applied on individual power plants. And I think the expectation is that courts by and large, and this is true over the years, have deferred to EPA's technical expertise in this area. Um, but the systems of emission reduction that EPA has identified um, are, are really not in existence. Um, and we can talk more about the details of that. But for, for coal-fired power plants, uh, the agency identified carbon capture and sequestration, CCS technology, as the best system of emission reduction. And, Unless a coal-fired power plant agrees, makes a binding, legally binding commitment to shut down by 2040, it has to install CCS by uh, by, by 2030, um, which is kind of around the, the 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 corner in terms of utility planning. But that was that was the standard for existing coal-fired power plants. Uh, for existing gas-fired power plants, the the standard was a choice between either carbon capture and sequestration or co-firing with, with what they call low GHG hydrogen. And, and again, I'm not gonna get into all the details, but, but basically um, for large plants that are frequently used, defined as 300 megawatts or more that are used 50% of the time, they have to either install CCS by 2035 
or they have to begin using low GHC hydrogen in 2032 and, and continuing on to a step down in 2038. Um, uh, for, a, for new gas fired power plants, which I think is an enormously important issue, uh, it was again based on either CCS or the use of low GHG hydrogen. And the time frame is, is essentially the same, that you can, you can build your plant now, and between now and 2032, you just have to operate based on sort of modern technology, high efficiency gas turbines. But you either have to install CCS by 2035, or you have to uh, begin using low GHG hydrogen in 2032. And again, it's a bit more complicated than this because there's different standards depending on the expectation for how much those plants are gonna be run. So that is um, maybe a too quick summary of, uh, of what the rule does. There are three or four major issues that I, I look forward to, uh, to discussing with Kevin and, and, and Justin. Thanks so much, Jeff, that was, that was great. And now what we'll do is return to Kevin and, and Justin for their perspectives. And Kevin, why don't we start with you on your perspective on the rule? Uh, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, as somebody who has um, spent a long time defending um, EPA's authority to establish um, greenhouse gas standards, um, I, I usually speak to different audiences than uh, the Federalist Society. I, I teach uh, climate law and policy at Stanford Law School, and I think that it's critically important that we be able to have forums like this where we can respectfully disagree with one another. And so I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I just wanted to take a step back and talk about, um, you know, we've been at this task of trying to think about since Mass V EPA, how EPA should be regulating greenhouse gas emissions as a regulatory endeavor, as something that is done pursuant to the Clean Air Act. We're primarily air lawyers on this call. And what we have now in the wake of passage of the Inflation Reduction Act is a whole new approach to addressing climate change in the US um, through tax incentives. And it's because of the Byzantine process of uh, budget reconciliation that we're able to get a bill passed with uh, a bare majority without um, being subject to the cloture rule. But what we have now, as opposed to the sticks that EPA would usually wield in order to drive greenhouse gas reduction is we have a lot of carrots. We have once in a generational investments out there, whether it's 369 billion, the, the, the funds aren't limited. It could be as Credit Suisse said as much as 800 billion in investment in emission reduction. Um, and there are some really critical tools uh, for the power sector um, in those investments. And those include the 45Q um, tax uh, credit for carbon capture and storage and the 45D tax credit for um, qualified clean hydrogen. And these are driving massive investments um, across our economy in devising a method of delivering these products, green hydrogen and making available CCS for a variety of sectors beyond the power sector. And what EPA has done in this proposal is they've said, Congress made these tools available. In fact, some of the authors of the Inflation Reduction Act said they specifically contemplated that CCS and qualified clean hydrogen would be available for EPA to consider as part of the best system. And EPA has said, we're gonna look out over the time horizon when this bill gets implemented, the IRA gets implemented, and we're gonna see dramatic changes happening in the power sector. And we're going to say that if you wanna continue operating your big coal plant past 2040, you need to take advantage of some of these incentives. And the same thing holds for gas-fired power plants. They're gonna be playing, they're gonna to continue to play a critical role for decades. EPA acknowledges that fossil generation can't just go away and is going to be necessary in order to backstop all the renewable generation. But they're saying, if you want to continue operating your gas plant at a high capacity factor, you're going to need to install some controls. And so that's kind of the framing of the big picture from my perspective of what EPA is doing here. 
And we can talk about um, how that reflects the, the contours of the statute and their regulatory determinations, but just wanted to provide that initial framing. Yeah, thank, thanks, Gavin. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Justin, I turn to you. Thank you for having us. Uh, I want to echo mm -hmm. Kevin, if I may, Kevin's remarks. Uh, Kevin's been an able defender uh, of the Clean Power Plan, and, and I presume now this proposal, uh, in all frankness, sometimes uh, more able than, than some of the folks whose official duties it is to do that. So thank you very much for joining us. It's an honor uh, to be here with you all. Uh, this proposal, unfortunately, suffers from similar fundamental defects to those in the Clean Power Plan. I think that EPA in this proposal and its backers in regulated community and civil society have just gotten too hung up on this fence line question. And they've convinced themselves that as long as they can claim that this rule stays inside the fence line, that is, as long as the rule and proposal identifies systems of emission reduction only measures that can be characterized as applying to and at the level of individual plants, uh, that they're in the clear. Now, there are actually arguments available that both carbon capture and low GHG hydrogen are not plant-specific measures, and maybe we'll get into that later, but let's set that aside for now. I think a close reading of the West Virginia opinion reveals that what SCOTUS really found to be an excess of EPA's authority under Section 111 uh, wasn't just the cap and trade form of the regulation, uh, but the regulation's goal. And that goal in the Clean Power Plan was forthrightly to adjust the nation's electric fuel mix at the aggregate level. Now, this new proposal pays lip service to renouncing that goal, uh, but for reasons we'll discuss later in the hour, uh, I just don't think that renunciation is credible. Uh, but let's zoom in on the statutory language that Jeff teed up of adequately demonstrated uh, and let's look at EPA's own gloss on what it thinks adequately demonstrated means. Uh, for those who want to follow along at home, this is on pages 33,272 to 33,273 of this year's volume of the Federal Register. Uh, this passage of EPA's proposal cobbles together snippets from DC Circuit case law. Uh, most of it's pretty old by now, and precisely none of this case law has anything to do with existing source regulation. So this is a crucial point. There is still no substantive case law on how prescriptive EPA can be on the existing source side, because 111D, as in David, the existing source provision was a rarely used backwater until fairly recently. Uh, and all attempts to use it more recently on the utility sector uh, have been struck down or halted for reasons having nothing to do with the state side as such. So EPA picks up here on the DC circuit having held that EPA is allowed to make reasonable projections as to the course of technological development so that EPA can set a standard that no existing plant can actually meet right now. Uh, so the DC circuit has squarely held as much for new sources. Most of these opinions explicitly say that this kind of technological nudging is allowed because the regulations at issue were dealing with new sources, not existing ones. So right there, that means that none of this case law on its face applies on the existing source side, uh, and EPA doesn't even acknowledge that fact in the proposal. Uh, so this is a major, major flaw in their claim to authority on the existing source side right from the get-go. So even on its own terms, the DC Circuit case law speaks of maybe a two or three year window for this projected nudge. That's nothing like the 15 year plus plan that we see here in this proposal. So there are some very wonky, weedy reasons why the DC Circuit case law is questionable. We can get into that if you want. But the bigger point here is that no court has ever blessed anything that looks anything like this 15 year plan. And EPA can't identify any prior rule that it's done where its projection of when the system of emission reduction will become fully available stretches out anywhere near this far. So there's a structural problem with the statute here for EPA. Congress in 111B, as in Boris, said that EPA must review its new source standards at least every eight years to see if they're still adequate. Uh, that should set a presumptive outer limit of any ability to bake in any kind of technological projections into a rule, even on the new side. Uh, and in fact, EPA seems to have almost or virtually almost always stayed well within that eight-year window in terms of its uh, compliance build-out and its phase-in of a new source rule. 
Again, EPA's proposal just does not engage with the implications in this regard of the review provision at all. EPA in its exegesis on adequately demonstrated in the pages that I cited openly says it can set a ramp for when the supposedly adequately demonstrated technology will in fact become available as long as it wants, as long as it can project a date certain when the technology in question will be available. And it says it can do the same for its projections, not just of the technology, but of any ancillary infrastructure, including but not limited to pipelines, uh, when that will be available and constructed, with again, no limit on the time depth or the industry breadth of these projections. EPA also openly says that it can issue these regulations as a quote, essential trigger for the sometimes lengthy process of implementing pollution controls which is a nice way of saying it has command and control authority over the economy to just will into being adaptation of technologies that are not now ready and will never be ready for more than three presidential terms out into the future. If that's adequately demonstrated, those words have no meaning. EPA's only fallback argument here is to say, don't worry, we have to be reasonable in all these projections and requirements. Well, that's very similar to what it said in defense of the clean power plan. Reasonableness is the indispensable background principle of judicial review of a regulation. Reasonable is not a mantra that the agency can utter to insulate its own actions from proper review. So in that way, this really is the clean power plan all over again. So just in closing, I'd like to suggest a way to think about this. The clean power plan argued from an absence of restriction and an absence of express prohibition in the statute to say that there was no horizontal limit on its authority to design a regulation that roped in other sectors in a cap and trade scheme or other non-regulated generation sources such as wind and solar into a cap and trade scheme to regulate the whole grid as such. This proposal similarly argues from an absence of explicit prohibition in the statute, says there are no vertical limits on its planning authority and how long it can plan out a ramp when again, supposedly, a uh, system that has been adequately demonstrated will in fact uh, be ready for prime time. The better reading of the understanding of adequately demonstrated is that it means that a technology has a proven track record and it'll soon be available at scale. So proven track record is what Justice Kagan said in her gloss on the statute in the dissent in West Virginia. And I think if you read that, that suggests that the entire Supreme Court has a narrower understanding of EPA's authority uh, that EPA has uh, in this, it, it, under this provision. And so in the same way that the fact in the clean power plan that states or planning authorities or companies were engaged in generation shifting planning uh, did not confer on EPA the authority to make that a regulatory requirement, I, I think so too here, uh, the fact, and we'll get into this in detail later, but the fact uh, that Congress uh, has, has ordered up almost a trillion dollars, I just heard, uh, of subsidies under its spending authority uh, does not confer regulatory authority on EPA to make that a binding regulation on, on companies, let alone on the states through the existing source side. Thank you, Justin. Uh, so I think now let's just get to a discussion. And uh, again, if you have questions, please uh, submit those questions. And I'll start off and kind of cut to the chase, uh, because I think there's one question that I think a lot of us probably have, uh, and this is touched on some already, but let's flesh it out some. Does this proposed rule raise major questions issues? And when you answer that, can you explain how the proposed rule is similar or different from the Clean Power Plan? And, and Jeff, let's start with you. Jeff, you're on mute. You'd think after three years I would have learned uh, I needed to click that button. Um, as I said at the outset, the EPA clearly had that doctrine in mind when they, when they wrote this rule. And so I think their theory is that they've managed to avoid any problems with major questions. Um, you know, the major question doctrine has not been terribly well defined uh, at this point. So we're sort of looking at a variety of factors that, that, that the courts might consider. I, I would say that I think 
they, I think they have a big problem because even though they don't explicitly use generation shifting as their control technology, they acknowledge that that will be the, the result of this regulation. In fact, it's a much more, it, it, it would be a, 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 much, um, a much more aggressive regulation in terms of, of, the, of the required emission reductions than the, than the Clean Power Plan. So EPA's own modeling shows that um, very, very few plans, even based on EPA's assumptions, would actually install these control technologies that EPA has identified and virtually all of them would, would shift to wind and solar and nuclear and other forms of, of, of generation. So I think that in and of itself is, a, is an issue. I, I also think, and, and you didn't ask this question, but I'll, 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 I'll answer it anyway. Is the Supreme Court likely to take up this case? And um, you know the fact that there's 1.2 million comments, I don't think is necessarily relevant. I always like to look at the number of substantive comments, but if you look at the number of substantive comments, it's still very impressive. And virtually, you know, every industry trade group views this as enormously important. So by that fact, that, that's not a reason that it, would, that it would trigger the major questions doctrine, but it certainly is an indication that this is enormously, enormously important to sort of the whole industrial, um, all the industrial sectors of the, of the United States. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, Kevin, what's your take on that? Uh, I mean, the Supreme Court said that the major questions doctrine applies in extraordinary cases. And um, the Clean Power Plan truly was something transformative of EPA's authority, where it was not doing as it had typically done. It was not looking at the available technologies that plants could apply. Um, it was looking at how the electricity system itself could be transformed. Here, EPA is looking into its toolkit, its long-held toolkit of, of projecting what technology is available, what technology is coming online, and saying we can make some projections about the availability of that technology and what it can achieve. And there is 50 years of precedent in the DC circuit, and Justin is correct that those cases predominantly, um, they all relate to 111B for new sources. However, there's no gloss in them that suggests that the statute means something different when it speaks in the same terms of the best system of emission reduction that has been adequately demonstrated. What the Supreme Court found offensive about the Clean Power Plan was that EPA arbitrarily decided the amount of appropriate coal-fired generation and then devised these caps in order to achieve that goal um, without reference to any objective criteria, they said, unlike a, an ambient air quality standard. And here, EPA is using objective criteria of what technology is available for these existing and new fossil units that they could apply over the course of the next couple decades in order to achieve emission reductions. And Justin is correct that typically the lead time that is afforded is fewer years than 15 years. Although um, in Jeff's administration, they proposed a rule under 111D, they finalized a rule under 111D for mercury emissions from this sector that projected that technologies would be more broadly deployed 13 years from now from when the rule was finalized, and therefore they could set more stringent budgets for those future years based upon the availability of that technology. So this is very similar to what EPA has historically done. And I agree with Jeff that the rule has been carefully crafted to try to avoid the major questions doctrine. Of course, this question is politically and economically significant, and that is one criteria that the Supreme Court suggests uh, determines whether or not a question is indeed major, but I don't think that's enough. The Supreme Court can't, every case can't be extraordinary. Every case concerning this provision of the statute can't be extraordinary. Um, EPA is not engaging in power system engineering here. What they're doing is setting technology based standards. And the baseline already projects that there'll be 117 or 118 gigawatts of retirement 
of a coal-fired generation. And this just nudges it a little bit more, 17 additional gigawatts of retirement from the baseline. And that fits squarely in the type of what the Supreme Court preserved role for EPA to set standards that incidentally might cause generation to shift. They were very decisive in that respect. And so from my view, this rule does not suffer from any of the deficiencies that the Supreme Court um, uh, ascertained in the Clean Power Plan. Thank you, Kevin. And Justin, let me give you your, your take real quick. I'll just say on major questions. So uh, when the agency repealed the Clean Power Plan in the summer of 2019, uh, it did not do so relying on the major questions doctrine. It went through a more traditional vanilla statutory interpretation analysis, said this demonstrates that generation shifting cannot be a valid system of emission reduction under the meaning of the statute. And then the agency looked at two clear statement canons to confirm, not to rely on, to confirm that. One was the federalism canon, which we'll hope we'll get into on the state plan side for existing sources. The other was the major questions doctrine, which up to that point, the Supreme Court did not actually recognize, at least not under that name. Uh, I think Justice Barrett's uh, solo, I think, concurrence in the student loan case from the last term uh, adopts a somewhat similar lens, and she's sort of in implicit dialogue with Justice Gorsuch. Justice Gorsuch feels this is very much a prophylactic constitutional measure. Justice Barrett, on the other hand, says, no, this is really just mousehold. We've always known that there are some ways that are not rational to read a statute, and that's what we're applying here. So I think similarly, uh, I wouldn't advise folks to hang their hat entirely on major questions, I would advise folks to look through this more through a vanilla lens and then see whether major questions inform that lens uh, as a way to think about what might happen in the Supreme Court if it goes there. But in terms of every action can't be extraordinary, that's certainly true. Uh, on the other hand, the Supreme Court said this was for extraordinary cases after having done it twice earlier that term in the OSHA vaccine mandate case uh, and in an extraordinary posture at the beginning of the term or maybe right before the beginning of the term in the uh, eviction moratorium case. Uh, so this court appears to believe that these extraordinary cases are coming more often, uh, and, and, and so that's why it might invoke it. Now, this really comes down to what you think the nature of the major questions doctrine is. Does it just look at sticker price? Is a little nudge okay? Or instead, does it look at the implications and breadth and limitlessness of the theory of authority that the agency is operating under? And again, EPA is very plain. There are no limits other than baseline rationality on how long and how detailed a plan it can envision for when technology will actually become available. And that sort of thing, I think, is dangerous territory if you're trying to avoid a reviewing court from looking at major questions. Uh, very quickly on the Clean Air Mercury Rule in 2005, it is true that some uh, aspects of that compliance did go out as far as 13, uh, as Kevin, as, as 13 years in the future from that rule, uh, as Mr. Plonkars noted. Um, but the Supreme, uh, similarly in the Clean Power Plan, uh, the, the defenders of the Clean Power Plan invoked uh, the clean air mercury rule to say this isn't new, uh, there is precedent, and that did not deter the majority in West Virginia at all. Also of note, the agency in 2019, when it repealed uh, the clean power plan, all but renounced uh, the structure of the clean air mercury rule. That is the United States government current position. I didn't see anything even acknowledging that fact, let alone uh, switching uh, uh, views again on a Fox standard there in this proposal. Uh, and so I do think that EPA doesn't really have any meaningful precedent to point to and, and is in serious trouble here. So a couple of people have asked a question regarding the Loper case. And I want to just be sure I ask it the way they framed it. Um, well, basically, the, the, the question is, if the court revises Chevron or overrules it, in the Loper Bright case, how will that outcome affect this, this, the forthcoming litigation regarding this rule? Anybody have any thoughts on that one? Could, um, I, I'm happy to briefly speak to that. I, I think the area in which uh, abrogation of the Chevron doctrine might be uh, most problematic for EPA is in its construction of the word cost uh, and, and specifically the phrase, uh, that when EPA determines what is the best system of emission reduction that has been adequately demonstrated, uh, it needs to take into account, quote, the cost of achieving such reduction. Uh, EPA in this proposal says that this is plainly, I think as the adverb it uses, plainly means that Congress is speaking of uh, the cost 
to the regulated company. Well, it doesn't say any such thing. Uh, EPA is acting as if it says the cost of compliance. That's what other provisions in the Clean Air Act, like the Title II car standards say. That's not what it said here. I don't think that's the best reading of the statute. I don't even believe that's a plausible reading of the statute to look at costs and sort of subtract out the subsidies and pretend those aren't real societal costs. Uh, now, EPA is not explicitly invoking deference here, I don't think. Uh, the Solicitor General of the United States, to my knowledge, hasn't filed a brief invoking Chevron deference in years. So I don't think that main, if the Supreme Court were to leave the Chevron doctrine in place, I don't think that would help EPA particularly. But if they were to strike it down on issues like what that cost language in the statute means, uh, I think that would, that would heap another uh, stone on the pile that they've got to uh, lift here. Hey, so why don't we go on to another question? Uh, I'm just going to get to the, on the other big question, uh, which is about the best system of emission reduction. So I'm going to state that language that Jeff highlighted earlier, and I'm just going to ask all of you, um, is the EPA correct that the proposed standards and emission guidelines reflect the best system of emission reduction that taking into account costs, energy requirements, and other statutory factors is adequately demonstrated. So let me just start with, let's start with you, Jeff. Sure. Um, I, I would add to what Justin said about, um, about Chevron deference. I, I think the term adequately demonstrated um, is also a, a key term in, in addition to the, the, the cost issue that, that, that Justin raised. So I, I don't know that the Loper decision in any way will seal the fate one way or another, uh, but it, it obviously would, I think, uh, suggest that, that, the, that the court is not inclined to uphold you know, fairly aggressive interpretations of the statute, and I think in particular on this question of what has been adequately demonstrated. I, I think EPA has, has two big problems. W one is um, it has to mean something. Uh, and the idea that adequately demonstrated means something that EPA uh, believes will come into being at, at a reasonable point in the future, I think it, it's, it's, it's a hard case to make. And, and I just point to two things. W one is, uh, try as they might, they, they can't point to any gas-fired plant anywhere in the world that uh, on a commercial scale has, has ever actually employed CCS. They, they rely, I mean, they do mention a, a small slipstream that was in place for a, a little while in the US. They mention a number of projects that have been announced, but not yet funded or, or built. So I think that in and of itself is an issue. I, I think the other big problem is, you know, the things that you can do at a power plant to capture your, your CO2 emissions don't actually reduce them. You need to have a way to transport them. You need to have a way to uh, in inject them into the subsurface. And that system, far from being adequately demonstrated, I think is very much being called into question. Anybody who sort of follows the news knows that uh, even in states that have typically been friendly to, to, to business, there's been a lot of op opposition to any CO2 pipelines. Um, and the idea that that we would have by 2030 a system in place, not only to transport, but to sequester um, millions of tons of CO2 emissions from coal-fired power plants, it's just hard to, it, it, it's just inconsistent with reality. I mean, there, this administration has said that it's fully in favor of CCS, but it has not managed to permit even a single sequestration site. And as far as I know, I don't know that there are any, and to, to, to have a, a sequestration for a, a power plant, you need to have a, what's called a class six well. I don't think any of the hundreds of proposals that have been, that have been submitted to EPA, no, no, that's not true. There's two that, <clears throat> that would accommodate coal, a coal-fired power plant. The permits have not been granted yet, but the vast majority of those are for industrial sources and not for and not for the power sector. So this, this broad system of emission reduction that includes not just the capture equipment, but a system of pipelines, a system of injection wells, um, is it, it, certainly not in existence. And I think a lot of people are skeptical that the time frame. well, I'll add myself to that list. There's no possible way that system will be in place by 2030, um, even if the rule is finalized today. 
uh, and, he, and, and much less. Uh, so, so anyway, I, 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 think, I think they have a real problem showing that this system of emission reduction has been adequately demonstrated. Uh, Jeff, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the pipeline issue because that's one of the questions from our audience member. Um, so you answered that. Kevin, let me turn to you. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, EPA has long interpreted this provision of the statute to provide it the ability to reasonably project out into the future about the availability of technology. The guardrails that the DC circuit has provided are that they can't engage in crystal ball gazing and they can't just base this upon pure conjecture or make just speculation, but they can look out towards the development of technology, even when it's not applied to a particular source category. When they decided that SCRs were appropriate for industrial boilers, there were none in the US that had ever used SCRs, although they were used for utility boilers. And so CCS is uh, an available technology. It's been used in the US for decades. Class six wells exist. There are class six well applications on file. And I grant you, Jeff, that there are significant challenges with building out all this infrastructure in the time frame, And that needs to be um, a, a significant effort put forth by DOE, by EPA, to overcome so many of the barriers, including the hostility um, that folks have towards any type of pipeline in order to allow this infrastructure, whether it's for hydrogen or CCS. And, you know, it, in, we, I definitely, have, of, of my conversations with EPA, have, have stressed to them that they need to play a leadership role if this rule is going to survive and ensuring that this infrastructure can be deployed on a time frame. And what is adequate lead time? Is it 2030? Is it 2035? Is it 2040? Those are questions that EPA is going to be grappling with uh, in response to the comments they received, which have pointed out that there are significant challenges. And Justin alluded to this earlier. There are some arguments that CCS isn't even an inside the fence line technology because it requires the coordination of all these other parties. My view is that the Supreme Court afforded um, the room for EPA to define a technology based upon the needs of for infrastructure to evolve outside of the fence line of a plan. I think that dichotomy inside the fence line, outside the fence line really fell away in that argument and is really irrelevant. It's really about the availability of the technology. Hey, can, can I, Darren, I'm not the moderator, but can I, can I ask you a quick question? You know, the, 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 um, the case law that Kevin refers to is, is very old DC circuit case law, what from the, from the 70s and the 80s. I've wondered whether EPA sort of puts that at risk by taking this position. Because if you believe that this is a big enough case to go to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court may uh, adopt a less flexible reading of what it means to have something that's been adequately demonstrated. And, and I, I, I assume that's something that EPA thought about, but they have favorable case law that they used in, in cases that Kevin mentioned, for example, with SCR, even though it hadn't been used on industrial boilers, you know, EPA was, was that was sort of a reasonable projection. But I, I do wonder whether the, that, that favorable case law could be uh, put at risk by, by taking this position here, but, and we'll, we'll have to see. And I think it will be, and just to speak to one aspect of the case law, Kevin correctly identified that crystal ball inquiry is the no-go line. EPA, the DC circuit has said, can look reasonably to the future, albeit it's talked about two or three years, uh, as opposed to 15 or 20, uh, but it can't engage in crystal ball inquiry. Well, EPA never stopped in this proposal to think, what is crystal ball inquiry? Well, if you do the case law research, uh, that phrase the DC circuit picked up from a, in 1973 in one of the first, maybe the first 111 case, well, it picked up crystal ball from a NEPA case from a year before. And in that NEPA case, uh, the court rejected challenges to a Department of Interior NEPA analysis because that NEPA analysis failed to consider alternatives that wouldn't come into existence until 1980, so eight or so years from the action taken, and said, you're not required to engage in that kind of crystal ball inquiry eight years out to the future. Well. If that's not required in an EPA analysis, a fortiori, 
twice that time length cannot be appropriate to impose as a regulatory requirement. So I think the crystal ball prohibition is squarely in play here. Even if the Supreme Court doesn't disturb any of that case law, this case law properly read does not permit this kind of rule. And of course, as Jeff notes, the Supreme Court has never spoken meaningfully to what 111 permits and doesn't permit here, even after West Virginia. EPA is at risk of losing all of this case law and constricting its authority far beyond what it thought it was before it engaged in any of this adventurism. Respectfully, I'll just say that I have clients who are putting hundreds of millions of dollars on the line for CCS and hydrogen technology. And usually um, companies uh, that have shareholders don't put that type of money on the line uh, based upon crystal ball inquiry. And, and, and I would similarly respectfully say that that's all well and good and hundreds of billions of dollars of subsidies under the spending clause have now been deployed. Uh, I, I question though that if this really is as uh, real and available, albeit 15 years from now, a, a future as the rule posits, why the need for a stick? Uh, why the need for the trigger, as EPA calls it, uh, to overcome hostility, as, as you said, to pipelines and so forth, and sort of fiat this into existence, if all is well and good as a business matter based on these subsidies? Let me get to a kind of a related question, I guess, um, to that. So the EPA uses the IRA subsidies and and Kevin, you brought up the 45Q tax credit before, and they rely on that a lot to help justify the feasibility of the technology that would be needed to be adopted. Um, is this appropriate? And then secondly, the EPA is required, and this is also brought up a little bit, the EPA is required to take into account costs, but it fails to account for the subsidy costs of taxpayers. And do you think that's problematic? So, so is it is it appropriate to, to rely on this 45Q tax credit and other subsidies to justify the technology? And is it kind of appropriate to not kind of like look at costs as just as impacting the regulated community as opposed to the cost of taxpayers? And Justin, let me go to you on that one. This is very problematic and I think it's potentially fatal to the rule. EPA explicitly says that it's determining the carbon capture clears the cost analysis, which is textually required because of the availability of these increased subsidies. And it, it all but says that for low GHG hydrogen also. Uh, again, the phrase is the cost of achieving the emission reduction or the cost of achieving such reduction is the literal words. Uh, and EPA says, quote, by its terms, this provision makes clear that the cost that the EPA must take into account is the cost of the affected source of the system. Uh, the provision says no such thing. Uh, the D.C. Circuit case law, the early case law, interpreted this term to include any number of broader considerations beyond direct compliance costs, including consumer costs. Uh, so EPA is, again, just way out over its skis here. And, and without this theory, the whole thing collapses. And just as a matter of policy and logic, it sort of has to be that way. If the sticker cost to the regulated company is massively subsidized by tax monies, that's not free money. It's coming from somewhere. This is like saying, my parents have just bought me diamond studded training wheels. So now my ability to ride a bike has been adequately demonstrated. It just, it just doesn't make any sense. And, and the EPA, in a bit of desperation in the proposal, points to a floor statement from Representative Pallone after the IRA was passed and characterized this as saying that Congress expected and intended that these subsidies would be plugged into the cost equation for a 111 standard. Uh, of course, Congress said no such thing. One member said that after the bill was enacted. And in fact, if you read Representative Pallone's full remarks, he says why this is such a great thing is because there are alternative forms of generation uh, which will not be similarly burdened by these new regulations. And so it will improve their comparative advantage. And I think that gets us to the pretext question. I think that, you know, with all respect to EPA uh, and to its proponents, we are not operating on a blank slate here. Uh, we, we saw what was, what was forbidden by, by the Supreme Court, which was attempting to shift the grid's fuel mix as such. Uh, and we're just coming right back in here with, with this, you know, in form it's different, but the goal is clearly the same. 
Uh, Administrator Regan was quoted as saying during the comment period, I'm quoting directly from his words as reported by a news article, we are working on a proposed power plant standard in the United States that helps us to transition from heavily fossil fuel resources to clean resources. I think that is the patent intent of this proposal, uh, and I think pretext does come into play here. Uh, thanks, Justin. Uh, Kevin, let me turn to you on those questions. Have EPA has typically looked at the cost to the regulated industry, and the case law speaks that the cost can't be exorbitant to the industry such that it would uh, be incapable of surviving. And so it is, in my view, perfectly appropriate for EPA to look at the effect of IRA subsidies on the availability of the technology. And frankly, we're seeing that. We're seeing projects get proposed because these subsidies are available. For EPA to blind itself to that would, would be arbitrary rulemaking. In their regulatory impact analysis, of course, they're going to consider the full societal costs associated with relying upon these, these subsidies. Um, but that's a different analysis than determining whether or not the technology is available, adequately demonstrated for an industry to apply to achieve emission reductions. Yeah, I, I, I add just one quick comment, and that is, this was something else that surprised me about the proposal. If you believe EPA's social cost of carbon, the total society cost is, is, is justified. And I, I think, I, so I don't know why they argued that the only cost that matters is the cost of compliance. I, I think that's a reading of the statute that's pretty hard to, to, to justify. And, I, and I, I agree in and of itself, I think that could be enough uh, to overturn the rule, even without getting into some of these questions that the agency didn't properly consider the cost of the rule and instead focused only on, on a small part of the cost. I would. I apologize for interrupting, but I would suggest, since this is a Federalist Society event, that we really should spend the last few minutes discussing the federalism implications on the state plan existing source side. Well, Justin, you're anticipating what I was going to ask next, so thank you. Um, so that is the next question, actually. We're going to get to a state-related question, so let me do that. Um, section 1D of the Clean Air Act. Um, it, it governs existing source emissions. It includes a major role for the states, unlike Section 111B, governing new sources, where you can regulate sources directly. Do you think this rule violates the so-called cooperative federalism envisioned in the Clean Air Act? And Justin, I'll just go to you since you. This proposal does violate the federalist nature of the text of Section 111D. Uh, it also is, uh, violates the underlying clear statement requirement, a background principle of statutory interpretation uh, that requires a clear statement of congressional intent to allow an agency to invade an area of traditional state sovereignty. Federalism is a shoe that didn't drop in West Virginia because there the court didn't need to get into the state plan side and the state latitude side in order to dispose of the Clean Power Plan. Uh, as an aside, Justice Kagan's ostensibly textualist dissent in West Virginia doesn't talk at all about the uh, source-specific text of 111D, uh, but I just want to read from 111D. 111D commands EPA in unusually stark terms. EPA shall permit the state in applying a standard of performance to any particular source to take in, dot, 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 to take into consideration, among other factors, the remaining useful life of the existing source to which such standard applies, this is very broad, deferential, federalist languages to the states that when they look at a particular plant, they're allowed to take into account that particular plant's characteristics when seeing whether they want to be less stringent. EPA hates this language. In three currently pending proposals, it's proposing to suffocate the state prerogative. That's the pending oil and gas methane rule, also under Section 111. Uh, its finalization is rumored to be imminent in advance of this fall's International Climate Conference. Uh, also, the pending revisions to the implementing framework regulations uh, governing how these rules work generally, and now this one. In each of these, EPA proposes to require that a state make a finding that EPA's presumptive standards cannot reasonably apply to a particular source before, they're less, before they establish a less stringent standard. That's nowhere in the statute. Uh, it, they propose uh, to require extra process uh, when they do that. That is nowhere in the statute. 
Uh, but none of this applies if a state wants to be more stringent. So it's a blatant one-way ratchet. It's very obvious what they're doing. Now, EPA has a shiny object here to distract people. It says, oh, but we're proposing to allow cap and trade as a compliance mechanism, averaging and trading between different power plants. Uh, the 2019 ACE rule didn't do that. We're the real federalists. Don't take your eye off the ball. EPA is also proposing that it has the authority to set a statewide aggregate reduction requirement, and it will brook no deviation from that. EPA cannot suffocate an express grant of state latitude, claim that it's making up for that by inserting the very same cap and trade scheme that the West Virginia court struck down, while still saying it ultimately gets to dial down that whole level while treating a state not as a sovereign co-regulator, but is nothing more than a giant source of greenhouse gas emissions. And let me just give you a chance just to respond to that. Well, I would say that, you know, there's nothing in this proposal, in the in the 111D proposal for fossil fuel generating units that runs roughshod, in my view, over the remaining useful life for other factors. States have the ability to consider this. They will be able to consider delaying uh, the technology, uh, the requirements, if if the technology should not be available, if there should be infrastructure concerns. And it's also what we have as a proposal, and EPA has received a lot of feedback. And so I would expect that they're going to take that feedback into account in defining what are the contours of remaining useful life or other factors. But nothing in the way this proposal is presented just abnegates the state's ability to apply those factors in determining how a standard applies to an existing source. And one thing the Supreme Court made clear is that EPA gets to decide what is the standard. To say that then they would just look elsewhere and say the state gets to just come up with their own standard and make, make it up on, as it goes along, that would be silly. So in my view, from my perspective, the Supreme Court affirmed EPA's role in actually setting the standards and how the state then implements it, that'll be seen. Uh, just, just a point of clarification, EPA identifies the best system of emission reduction that isn't adequately demonstrated. It is the state that establishes a standard of performance for particular existing power plants. Take a look at West Virginia, Justin. Take, take a look at 111D, Kevin. So let me just ask a question about reliability to a policy question really quick, and then we'll close out. Um, some people have asked about reliability, and I was interested in asking about reliability. First of all, does the, and I'll just ask it quick, as opposed to a policy question and a legal question. Does the EPA consider, uh, in their analysis, the reliability impact of this proposed rule um, at all? And just, I'll just, just quickly, can somebody respond to that and, and what you think the policy implications of the rule would be for reliability? I don't know, Jeff, do you have any thoughts on that? So there's no explicit analysis of reliability in the in the proposal, which is a, a bit surprising. I, I think I think EPA's view is if there's any reliability problems that come up, we, we can fix them in the future. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I hate to be so cavalier about it, but anybody who is at all involved with reliability in the power sector and some of the concerns that have been raised has to acknowledge that this raises serious reliability concerns. And I, I think the view at EPA, um, certainly among the political leadership, is that's something we can deal with in the future. For now, we just need to have this aggressive rule out there. Let me, let's look to the uh, future a bit. Um, when would we expect this proposed rule to be finalized? I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. Well, the regulatory agenda, the regulatory agenda, I think, says uh, March of next year. So it would be out fairly, fairly soon. It would be lickety split by EPA standards. And they would probably want to have it finalized before it could be subject to the Congressional Review Act, presumably. So March would likely be safe for it. Uh, and let me ask one other question looking forward. Well, we've kind of, in many ways, discussed this to some extent. And I know that predicting what the courts will do is hard, but what do you think the likely legal outcome for this rule is going to be in the courts? I know it's tough, but just given what we may already kind of know where you guys are going to land on this, but any quick thoughts on it? That's me. I, whoever, Kevin, you want, what do you think? 
Justin, I'm in interested to hear your perspective. I think if he, if he, if EPA finalizes this rule, anything like in its proposed form, I think there's a very significant chance that it will receive a preliminary injunction, potentially from the DC Circuit, and if not, then from the Supreme Court. Uh, I think that there is uh, potentially a very easy way to explain to the Supreme Court that at least on the low HGHG hydrogen side, this is just the clean power plant with an extra step. Instead of requiring fossil fuel fired power plants to subsidize directly their competitors' generation, this BSER would require them to certify that their fuel is generated by their competitors' generation. It's one more step. It's the same thing. We just see a, a few more minutes. I want to give each of you just like one minute. I'll just go, Jeff, we'll start with you, and we'll just go Kevin and Justin. Just anything we've missed, uh, anything you want to add? So, Jeff, start with so you. So, I, I, I want to just step step back in and, and think, I think, the, the big picture here. The, I think what we've seen here and what we saw in the Clean Power Plan is if EPA did something that was sort of squarely acceptable under the Clean Air Act, they wouldn't get very much in the way of emission reduction. And, uh, uh, and so I think in both cases, it's caused them to sort of swing for the fences. We saw that that didn't go so well for the clean power plan. And I, I think I'm with Justin. I mean, we'll see what the final rule says. I'm sure they will make some, they, they will need to make some uh, changes, but but if they finalize something that's similar to this, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's if it stayed by the DC circuit um, and if not by the Supreme Court. And ultimately, I, I just think uh, for many of the reasons we've discussed, uh, it, it, it is unlikely to stand up in court. Now, EPA's answer to that would be, if you believe their analysis, almost all of these reductions are gonna come anyway, right? I mean, their, their baseline shows that the vast majority of these plants shut down without this rule. So, so, so maybe uh, if, if that's what they really believe, their, you know, their view is this wouldn't have such a big impact anyway. But I, I, I think it's at legal, at legal jeopardy. Go ahead. Anything we missed? I'll, I'll return to the, what I started with, that um, not every case is extraordinary. It can't be the case that every case implicates major questions. And um, here you, you don't have the CDC engaging in landlord tenant law. You have EPA setting emission standards fairly in its wheelhouse. And so my view is that um, this rule, it'll, be, it'll change in its final form for sure. So it's, it's, it would be idle for me to speculate on its, how, how, whether it's gonna survive or not, but I don't think it implicates major questions. And I would, I would just say that I don't think this is at all a good faith attempt to abide by West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia, the majority in footnote three, said that Justice Kagan's dissent suggests that EPA could bring about the same result of generation shifting by, for example, simply requiring coal plants to become natural gas plants, dot, dot, dot. Of course, EPA has never ordered anything remotely like that, and we doubt it could. Less, uh, less than a year later, EPA proposed to do just that, and in fact, more so, because rather than requiring fuel shifting over to gas, they're requiring fuel shifting to low GHG hydrogen, which simply doesn't exist yet. Uh, so I think that this is very easily portrayed as EPA being in all but open defiance of the high court, uh, and it's regrettable that the agency is going down this path. So thanks so much. First of all, I just want to say how important I think it is. And I want to echo what Kevin said about having kind of an open discourse on these issues. It's just, and that's what I think is so great about the Federal Society. So I do really appreciate that. And I, Jeff, Justin, and Kevin, and just all of you, thank you so much for sharing your expertise today on this important rule. And of course, I want to thank all of you for participating in today's program, or if you're watching and recording of this event, thank you. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Thanks. Darren. And just to echo what Darren said on behalf of the Federal Society, thank you to our speakers today for sharing your time and expertise with us today um, and to the audience for tuning in. If anyone is interested in finding more content like this, you can check out our website at regproject.org or follow us on any major social media platform at FedSocRTP to stay up to date. Until next time, we are adjourned.